All right, so before we begin, I would just like to state for the record that today is October 6, 2022, and my name is Ben Bauman, and I am in Indianapolis, Indiana, speaking via phone with Bill Friend, who is located in Macy, Indiana, and we are doing an interview for the Indiana Legislative Oral History Initiative. So just starting off, when and where were you born? I was born uh, here in Miami County in Duke's Hospital, uh, Peru, Indiana. Okay. And uh, what were your parents' names? My father's name was Gerald Dewald Friend. D-E-W-A-L-D. Gerald Dewald Friend. And my mother's name was Eva Warner Friend. Okay. And when did your family first move to Indiana? Well, I live in, uh, I live on the 80-acre original farm uh, that the friends have owned since, uh, for 153 years. I am actually the fifth generation in this wow. house. Uh, and as I tell people, my job is to not screw that up. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I, my family came here. Uh, they actually moved from the Dayton, Ohio area. Uh, and moved here to Miami County. Uh, this farm was purchased 1869. Wow, jeez. Well, that's pretty cool. But I guess, yeah, a lot of pressure on you there to make sure. It's pretty, it's pretty <laughs> unique uh, in, in the world of families and acreage and that sort of thing. Yeah, I can't think of many people who have lived in the same had the same property in their family for that long. That's that's impressive. Uh, the house um, uh, the is brick. It's a brick home, two story brick farmhouse. Uh, the bricks were actually uh, made across the road from where the house is now. Wow. Uh, the friend family back then had a tile mill and a brick kiln. And uh, actually made the bricks. See, they're a, a soft red clay, and uh, the house has been painted yellow for many years, so it would try to seal out the moisture. The moisture would wick through the um, red brick. This house was built in 1873, and then uh, in 2007, we did an extensive remodeling, added on a, a large kitchen, family, living room, uh, garage so it looks different uh, from the road uh, but it's uh, still we still live and use all of the old house from 1873 wow that's that's really cool okay um, so let's see do you have any siblings uh, I had one brother uh, brother Jim who is about four and a half years older than me, and, and he passed away uh, about 11 years ago. Oh, okay. And he, uh, at age 49, he was diagnosed with uh, Lewy body disease, which is very similar to Parkinson's, only it's more cognitive than uh, the shaky Parkinson's. Right. Jim never had the tremors, but he had severe uh, mental capacity uh, problems. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, yeah. How would you describe your childhood? Well, we grew up on a farm, uh, northern Miami County. My, <clears throat> my dad and grandpa had purchased uh, 160 acres uh, in northern Miami County in uh, 1952. 1952, they bought it at an auction, and uh, we moved up there. Uh, uh, so I was three years old. I was born in 1949, uh, July 14th of 1949, and uh, we moved up to the North Farm in uh, 1952, and that's where I was raised, and then that's where my wife and I lived uh, until 2007. Yeah, we raised our family up there, and now our oldest son is living up there. So we have some longevity within the community. Yeah, okay. That's cool. 
And so you wanted to, how did I describe my childhood? Well, I grew up on a working farm and I had chores to do to take care of pigs. And uh, early on we had some cattle and calves. And um, But then <clears throat> it was more uh, the pigs. And uh, my mother was a third grade teacher. So uh, education was very important. I was supposed to do well in school. And uh, she kind of made sure of that. My dad not so much. He he was busy working the farm. And so uh, I got a good dose of both sides being um, academic or learning to appreciate academics and then also knowing how to do things outside with my hands and how to operate uh, tractors and machinery and take care of animals. Yeah. So I always had chores to do. And uh, I was always somewhat envious of uh, the kids who lived in the little town of Macy or Denver because they could always hang out together. They didn't have to work and they could get into all kinds of mischief. And uh, that was stuff that uh, kind of got by me. I didn't, uh, I didn't have those opportunities. So that yeah. uh, but I had a great childhood. We went to, at that time, we went to a Methodist church in Macy. Uh, and uh, so that's, and then I went to a small, uh, the Macy Elementary School, part of the North Miami Consolidated School District. But uh, uh, the North Miami District is the five northern townships of Miami County. And at that time, every township had a school. So there was a school in Macy, a school in Gilead, a school in uh, Mexico, a school in Chile. Uh, uh, so they, we had all the, every township had a school. And of course, basketball being what it was, uh, when the consolidation occurred and those elementary schools were closed, um, there were some angry parents because yeah. they lost their basketball team. Yeah, I bet. Uh, yeah. So, and that's just part of it. Uh, but I went to Macy Elementary, then uh, <clears throat> North Miami schools. Uh, the new consolidation opened in 1961 in the fall, and I started in the seventh grade. So my class was the first class to go completely through the, uh, the North Miami junior, junior and senior high school. Uh, and I graduated there in 1967. Yeah. Um, then, uh, following, uh, high school graduation, my, uh, <clears throat> high school geometry teacher was a man named Dave Huffman and Dave had accepted the job of, uh, assistant uh, dean of enrollment I think that was his title and he came back to North Miami and he got four of us out of my class to go to Indiana Central College which is now the University of Indianapolis and so four of us including the val two valedictorians uh, went to the University of Indianapolis uh, Indiana Central College, and we graduated both high school and college together. Uh, in 1971, we graduated from Indiana Central. So uh, that was kind of my educational path. Um, the uh, start of my senior, junior, the end of my junior year, start of my senior year in college, uh, I had applied to... Um, Indiana University Medical School, and that uh, they sent me a letter of uh, we did not uh, take action on your application. You, your application is still pending. Um, we will be in touch. So it was one of those. And then about mm, end of March, first of April. I got the Dear John letter that said I was not going to go to medical school, mm. which gave me a, 
an attitude for a while about the academic uh, profession because I, but it was, you know, it was my own dumb fault. When you're a kid, when you're a young person like that, you think you can do everything for yourself. And I thought that's the way it would be. And it was not, I needed, I should have asked for some assistance from my local doctor, from some other people who would have had some influence. I failed to do that. And, uh, and of course, 1971, Vietnam War, civil rights, all of the things that were going on at that time, uh, and uh, they probably wouldn't admit that they were doing it, but uh, universities were uh, using a quota system uh, to make sure that they had included more minorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always assumed that that's, I was a victim of that. Okay. Um, So... What did you know about your family's political views when you were growing up? When I was six years old. Uh, in fact, my grade school picture, when I was six years old, I have a, uh, I think it was an I Like Ike. A little, they were a little metal pin that you would bend over and hook into your, into your uh, pocket. And my school picture, is a, I'm in a little flannel shirt, and on that shirt pocket is one of those little I Like Ike campaign buttons. Okay. And, of course, that would have been I Like Eisenhower, President Eisenhower. And I remember when I was in about the fifth grade, uh, Richard Nixon was campaigning in Rochester, Indiana at the fairgrounds, and my parents took me out of school, me and my brother, and we went to the uh, Nixon uh, campaign rally in Rochester. So from the very start, we've been staunch Republicans, uh, and I'll give you some history here. My grandfather, Charlie, Charles' friend, was the Union Township trustee and actually operated the Deedsville School uh, here in Union Township. Uh, So he had to hire and fire teachers and bus drivers, uh, the cooks, had to uh, pay for all the food supplies, um, buses. And uh, so Charlie was township trustee and then following that he was the president for 25 years of the miami county remc the when the rural electric came through and uh so that was a my grandfather was a strong republican and uh my grandmother was a staunch um german democrat and she delighted in canceling his vote. Um, okay. Made, made for some interesting arguments. But uh, then my dad uh, was on the county council of Miami County for 14 years and was a was a chairman part of that time of the county council, which is the fiscal body. And uh, he, of course, always ran on the on the Republican ticket. Um, Growing up, growing up, my mother, uh, the saying that I remember was, and this is a quote, well, we lived through Harry Truman, didn't we? Um, yeah. That was her sarcastic <laughs> remark about uh, Democrat President Harry Truman. So, um, and then <clears throat> when I returned uh to the farm after college. Remember, I'm the youngest son of the farmer, and my dad was in his 50s and needed help. So I ended up uh, getting into the farming business with him and my mother. Uh, I had to work at something there for a while, so I worked in a uh, steel power corporation had a factory in rochester and they made engine sleeves Hmm. the uh the cylinders that pistons go up and down uh, and i made thousands of engine sleeves for various makers of engines 
uh, but then the farm got to be too big and too much and I quit uh, and by that time they had asked me if I would uh, run for and serve on the Allen Township Advisory Board and I said sure so I ran for I was on the ballot for the advisory board and then after I was elected we did a little research and the uh, advisory board members at that time were supposed to be freeholders landowners well I didn't own anything I didn't even own a cemetery block you know so I had to resign and then uh, during that campaign process I had gone to a young Republicans organization and uh, <clears throat> I met my wife Ann and uh, uh, my wife to be at that point and so we got married in 1975 in February and have been married now almost 48 years wow so, okay yeah but uh, her dad was running for sheriff of Miami County on the Republican ticket. And if you will remember, 1974 was the election year. That was right following Watergate. And it was a Democrat sweep everywhere. Yeah. Except Ann's dad, uh, John Rusi, was, uh, he led the ticket. He was overwhelmingly, uh, elected john had been a state trooper for over 20 years and then ran for sheriff and he served two terms as sheriff of miami county so uh <clears throat> ann and i when we relocated to the farm on uh in allen township um where i was raised and then where i raised my family uh, they asked me if I would be the trustee up there in Allen Township. And uh, so I was the township trustee. I was elected to the township trustee. I did that for about six years. Then there was a, a um, vacancy on the county council, the fiscal body. And I was caucused in uh, at that time to the county council. And I was on there for three and a half years. And then uh, the county auditor was termed out and they asked if I would run for county auditor. And I said, well, I really, I turned them down three times and then finally I did it. So I served one term as county auditor of Miami County and then was approached to uh, run for state representative. District 23. Okay. Well, uh, and the, uh, that came about because our incumbent had announced his retirement because he had health issues. So I had help and got everything arranged, had a committee, was raising money. Uh, after he had announced his retirement, then he changed his mind. And they asked me if I would back away, and I said no. I got too much invested already, and I think I'll be elected. So I actually defeated an incumbent of my own party who had 12 years seniority. Wow. And, uh, uh, so that was how I was introduced to the legislature. Um. And uh, then uh, I served in the legislature. Uh, I was elected in 1992, and I served until the end of 2018. So uh, 26 years of service. Um, in 2002, I was uh, elected. Uh, we were in the minority, so I was the minority floor leader. And then when we got into the majority, I was the majority floor leader. And then in 2014, um, speaker appointed me speaker pro tem. And so I uh, 
when I retired, I was Speaker Pro Tem, and from time to time, I would preside over the over the chamber, and uh, we would conduct our business, and uh, I would be the presiding officer. So, but I was part of a leadership team that we. I'm very proud that we were able to uh, get Indiana out of debt and into a budget surplus situation along but at the same time we were uh, sending a lot of money towards uh, public education um, both at the k-12 level and at the university level and uh, i think we made some great progress Um, of course i was serving under let's see i served under evan by frank o'bannon joe kernan Mitch Daniels and Mike Pence. So okay. those, those were the governors that I served under, and I knew them all. And uh, to the degree that I knew them, I liked them all. Yeah. Yeah. So, Interesting. That's okay. kind of that is my chronology of, of my service, and so I hope that wasn't too too far out of line. No, that was good. You gave a, a really nice summary of that. Went over already a lot of questions I had, so now I can get more in-depth with you then. Um, So thinking about when you were first running for office in the General Assembly, did you have like a particular campaign strategy at all? I had been the county auditor, and and I'd been on the county council, so I was very familiar with uh, how budgets are put together. I was very familiar with how property is assessed and how, you know, uh, the assessed value times the rate equals the levy. And many, I discovered that many of my colleagues were not as well versed in that uh, property tax system as I I was or I am. And I, uh, uh, So I talked a a lot about local government, listening to the public, concentrating on uh, economic development and improving uh, our local situation, uh, highways and and, uh, growth and those sorts of things. So that, I guess, was my strategy. Um, And I never said one ill word about my opponent. And uh, I just wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. That, I'm a positive campaigner. And, um, of course, my opponent, who had announced his retirement and then reneged, uh, I beat him two to one. And uh, and one of the advantages that uh, year was that it was a redistricting year. And, and the district changed dramatically. Uh, the district went from Miami County clear down to... Uh, through Howard County, Wabash County, and into Tipton County. So I had four parts of four counties, and they were all um, very rural and agricultural and uh, new territory. So the people in the southern areas, they didn't know the incumbent any better than they knew me. All they knew was that I was a guy... 43 years old uh, and the incumbent was in his 70s and not in the greatest health. So those were factors that were uh, very influential in uh, my winning. And then um, I had a a man filed as a Democrat to run against me in the fall um, but he never campaigned. He never did anything. He just said I don't want Bill to just walk into this office. He needs to uh, have an opponent and earn it. So that's the way that worked. And and then, you know, I was elected 13 times, and I never had – many times I was unopposed, and many times I might have a token uh, candidate, someone who might be, oh, I would say independent or unitarian or libertarian, you know, anything of that nature. So that's that was kind of my history in uh, being elected in the General Assembly. Yeah, okay. 
Um, now, did you ever do any of like the door to door campaigning or anything? <laughs> when, it's, it, yes, I did in Peru. I did in uh, Tipton, Windf Windfall. But when you have a large rural district, yeah. You know, I, I, I served with people from Indianapolis who could said, well, I can walk across my district in 45 minutes. <laughs> and I and I would say, I can't drive across my district in an hour and a half or two hours. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do you do, you know, you can't, it's it's difficult to do effective door-to-door -door in, a, in a rural yeah. territory like that. Yeah. But yeah, we did. In fact, um, the first, uh, first time... Uh, we went door to door in Peru. It was in October, close, getting close to November. And uh, my wife actually got uh, bitten on, on the leg by a pit bull. Oh my gosh! Had broke his leash and got off and and came and grabbed her by the leg. And we had to go to the emergency room and all that business. And yeah. so we did a little bit of door to door. Wow. Okay. I guess. Guess too much door to door. That's crazy. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what did you think of the election process? Did it seem like it was pretty straightforward and everything? Yes, I think it was at that time. And of course, you know, I've always I've had to sit through those uh, speeches and tirades about how um, we Republicans are not. We don't deal fairly in the election process, and we we do evil things like uh, require oh I don't know a picture ID to prove who the heck you are. You mm -hmm. know you use a you have to present a picture ID everywhere you go to to cash a check, get on an airplane, uh, uh, you name it. And but yet um, the Democrats always said, well, we were disenfranchising many people because they didn't have a picture ID. And I said, that's hogwash. And then secondly, uh, we no longer have election day. We have election month, mm -hmm. which as far as I'm concerned, uh, lots of things can happen in a month, especially if you vote the first day that you're eligible and that ballot lies around, lies around, flies around. You don't know where it is and you don't know if it gets counted or if it gets lost or, whatever um i just think there's an element of personal responsibility that is necessary in a democracy mm -hmm. you have to take part and you have to take it seriously and it should be up to you to find a way to get to the polls and if you can't because you're ill you're traveling you're away whatever there is there are provisions to take care of that but just to make it wide open uh, you got 30 days to vote. I have never felt that that was rational. I never have. Yeah. And I know that that causes eyebrows to go up, but that's the way I feel. Yeah. So I'm being very candid with you. I'm not pulling any punches. Okay? No, hey, that's that's what we that's what I want. So <laughs> this is great. Yeah. I mean, the goal is to get you know your perspective on what things were like when you served. So this is history. So this is really important to know. Um, so and I'm also very opposed to mail-in ballots because oh, okay. I think that's where fraud begins. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so were these voting issues that you're describing, were these debated a lot when you served? Oh yeah. Every year, because when I, when I started, we had election day. Yeah. But every year we would soften it up and make voting um, more convenient, uh, more open. Um, we would have, actually we've progressed to, you know, vote centers. We don't, not every township had a place to vote anymore. But when I started, I voted in Allen Township and my parents voted in Union Township and and uh, and now, uh, guys, I think we go to we can either go to Macy uh, to Allen Township to vote, or we can go to uh, Denver, which is in Jefferson Township, and we can vote there. 
you know, or we can go to the courthouse and vote in the clerk's office. It's, uh, and, and we've made it so convenient that, you know, there's really no excuse for people not to vote. And, uh, so I, and that, yes, those things were always debated and whatever we did was never enough to satisfy the other side. And we were always disenfranchising somebody and it was usually over the picture ID. Okay. Yeah. Would you say the debates were like, equally intense in the early 90s to when you were getting close to leaving in like the late 2010s or were they was it different oh they were very intense and the and the uh and um it's just like many things in life Mm -hmm. uh the progress was the, the progress in the eyes of the democrats was not made in one revolutionary swoop but it was made uh a little at a time um it was kind of a insidious thing where there's two days here or five days here or um we'll accept this or we've got provisionary i mean mean, there were the 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 easing of the voting uh, requirements was uh, done over time. Okay. Done over time. So, but the, the the speeches were all kind of canned talking points. They've, we've heard this all before. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. So thinking back then to when you first found out that you won your election, what was your reaction? Well... Uh, I used to, when I first started, I would tell groups, you know, the first thing you do is find out where all the restrooms are <laughs> in, uh, in that big building because you, 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 you just have to do that. Yeah. And then second of all, uh, I would explain to groups that I was, I felt like I was an ordinary citizen in an extraordinary circumstance. And, uh, I think that's still the case. I, I would describe it the same way. Yeah, okay. That's cool. Um, let's see. Did you feel like you had a pretty good idea of how the Indiana General Assembly operated uh, before you started working as a state legislator, or was there like a learning curve? Or Well, I, I had a pretty good idea because I had been in the county council and was involved with the um, Association of Counties. And then when I was the county auditor, uh, I was uh, I was the first vice president of the State Auditors Association. If I had stayed for a second term, I would have been the president or chairman of the 92 my uh, 92 county auditors association um and so i had worked my way up through the ranks and been recognized as someone that um people would listen to and i would listen to them and and then we would try to solve issues and solve problems and i it was um so yes i was associated that's how they came to me and asked me to run for state representative when, when uh, Representative Musselman announced he was going to retire. And then, of course, he changed his mind. But uh, the people who had talked me into or persuaded me to be a candidate, uh, they stood by me. And, we, and that's how I stayed on the ballot and stayed in the race. And... and uh, and I won that primary. Believe me, it is a very lonely feeling in a primary. Yeah. It's a very lonely feeling because the party people who you depend upon, they want to support the winner. Okay. And, and so oftentimes you can't get a commitment. Mm. They're going to they're gonna vote for you. 
but uh, I'm going to vote for you, but I can't tell you I'm going to vote for you, you know, and, and, wow. and I can't give you any, I can't give you any money because uh, I don't want my name on the list because I don't want anyone to find out. So, I, you know, you get a lot of that, or I did at that point. Yeah. Uh, but it was controversial what I was doing, running against uh, Representative Musselman. So, um, you know, why yeah. are you doing this? I have people asking, why are you doing this? And, <laughs> he said he was going to retire. Oh. And how close was the election result between you and him? I beat him two to one. Oh, okay. And it wasn't close at all. Yeah, yeah. So I guess then when it came to the relationship with your constituents, it, it, it was probably fairly easy to communicate with them since the majority voted for you. And yeah, it wasn't like a really close race or something that you ran. No, and but I can tell you this: that uh, they never spoke. He never spoke to me again, and his wife never spoke to me again. Wow. Okay. In fact, they av- they avoided me. Like if we would go to the funeral home for a, an, a common acquaintance, um, they would. She would hide behind the door. I mean, it was the they resented me and didn't like me for the rest of their days. Wow. They're both, they're both gone now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's pretty wild. Um, let's see. So jumping to, uh, your service in the general assembly, do you remember the very first bill that you sponsored or authored? My first year, uh, I had a bill, something that dealt with for the auditors association. It was, a just a technical change. It wasn't very, it wasn't very controversial, but it was, uh, Mike Phillips was the speaker, Democrat from Boonville. And, uh, Mike, uh, he let my bill be passed. I was a freshman Republican and I might've been the only Republican bill that passed that year. But, uh, and when my bill passed and everyone was, you know, looking at me with their mouths open. And uh, I was at the, still at the microphone, and uh, Mike Phillips from the podium said to me, he said, Representative Friend, that one's for Kermit Burroughs. Hmm. Kermit was uh, Speaker of the House in the 70s, and he ran for Lieutenant Governor when that was still elected on the, on the ballot. Yeah. And he lost to John Mutz. And uh, so Kermit returned to his little farm, and he did some other things. But um, that's how, that was the remark that I received from Speaker Phillips at that time. That one, he said, Bill, Representative Friend, that's for Kermit Burris. So um, go figure. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um. How often would you say you had to work with Democrats on legislation when you served in the General Assembly? I did it willingly. And, and now I'll say this. Um, when we were in the minority, there was a lot of give and take. I would go seek out a, a Democrat, someone like a Dale Grubb. Uh, Dale and I were both farmers, same age. And he was from Covington, um, and we did a lot of agricultural stuff together. Oh, and okay. On the Ag Committee, it was not partisan at all. The common interest was agriculture and uh, the agriculture community, and we were we knew that we were you know a minority group, and we had to work together to get anything accomplished. So I worked very well with. Uh, Dale Grubb, he worked very well with me. We're still good friends. So, um, and then on other things, um, I would just try to seek them out. Now, I will tell you this, that once I got into leadership in 2002, and I had all the duties of being a leader of the caucus, uh, I became much less parochial if you get my drift, yeah, and I had to be more inclusive. I had 92 counties to think about instead of four. 
so I I had to kind of adjust my attitude. And then, of course, you know, because I was in leadership, I would end up traveling all all over the place to uh, uh, encourage and select and represent uh, leadership to members of the caucus and then help raise money for the caucus. And so um, I had a, my world had to expand. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess. You always have to adjust when those positions change. Um. And, and I guess to finish that thought, and once I was in leadership, my focus of bills I could sponsor and advance was reduced because I was so busy with um, hurting the cats, so to speak. I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I... I, I uh, I had the office right off the chamber, and I had a big couch in there that I took down, big big sofa, and I had all kinds of people through that office. And uh, I can I I'm not going to share with you all of the secrets, concerns, uh, right. uh, turmoils that they had, but there were lots of tears shed on that couch because of people being upset. For one reason or another, many of them personal deaths. Um, maybe their child uh, was on drugs, or maybe something difficult happened in their community. I mean, I, there were just lots of things that, and I had to save the. My my job was to save these situations from the speaker. He didn't have time to field all the. You know, when you got fifty to sixty in the caucus. And plus all the lobbyists and all the government that you got to do, the speaker doesn't have time to take care of the more personal, minor things. You just yeah. So that was my that was my role. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, how influential would you say then, based on your experiences, uh, was party leadership when it came to what legislation would get passed? Well, we were very influential because we always had an agenda. Yeah. We would always put out an agenda before every session so that uh, people knew what we were going to try to do. Okay. And uh, we were not bashful about that. Did you ever have to deal with situations where people for like your own party might try to rebel against that agenda? Oh, yeah. Occasionally we did. I remember how difficult it was for daylight savings time. Oh, okay. that, that was a killer. Still yeah. Is. yeah. People are still mad at me for that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, daylight savings time and when when uh, Governor Daniels leased the toll road, holy cow, see, when, when Governor Daniels leased the toll road, I represented my district at that time went from – uh, Miami County, the north half of Miami County, I went clear up to Wakarusa in Elkhart County. Okay. Yeah. I had five counties, uh, and that would have been Miami, Fulton, Marshall, Tosiasco, and Elkhart. So I had five counties, northern Indiana, all conservative, all rural, and and uh, I would go to those Farm Bureau meetings in Elkhart County, and holy cow, they were uh, they were irate. Mm. They thought they were going to have Spanish and Australian flags flying over the toll road, and uh, you name it, you name it. And uh, I had to manage myself through that, and then we had to find a way to get it passed, and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. We had speaker and I would have two on one, two on two meetings with uh, members that were, I guess the word would be recalcitrant. Uh, they were not happy and uh, didn't want to vote for it. But we finally got it done and uh, it passed. And uh, not without a lot of heartburn, I can tell you that. Yeah. 
So you mentioned also the daylight savings times legislation. Uh, could you describe a little bit about what that debate was like when you served? Well, it was very controversial because <clears throat> Republicans and Mitch Daniels wanted it because uh, the people who favored it were the bankers, the people in the communications business, the people in the transportation business, and the businessmen because uh, <clears throat> they want in Indiana, they wanted Indiana to be aligned with uh, the, the, all of those businesses on the East Coast. Okay. Um, and especially the folks in the transportation business, uh, buses, trans, uh, uh, semis, uh, buses, semis, uh, airlines, they were constantly running up against uh, confusion over times. So uh, it became that group and the Chamber of Commerce, of course, and uh, uh, the, the ones who were opposed it were the theater people. Mm. Um, the theater folks said, well, wait a minute, you're going to make more daylight in the evening and people aren't going to be as likely to go to a movie and da, da, da. And so, and then you just had the folks out here in the country who said, well, you're going to, foul up my time schedule with the cows or with my livestock or I don't want the kids standing out there in the dark waiting for the school bus and um, I don't want to change my clock twice a year and so, you know, I mean it just went on and on and, yeah. um, and it still does still does yeah. and, uh, but then you also have to remember that um, we had a member from Vincennes Knox County uh, his viewpoint is never going, and, and his constituents, they will never agree with the people in Fort Wayne. Ain't going to happen when you when you throw out this time issue because of the geographic difference. And that's, it is what it is, you know. Uh, we made the decision, and of course you still have some folks up in northwest Indiana that align, their clocks align with Chicago. And that's their decision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are always tough, tough debates that go on. <laughs> um, what were the interactions like between Democrats and Republicans over the course of your career? Well, you just have individuals, you know. Uh, I tried to work with everyone, mm -hmm. and, and because, you know, if if uh, the Democrat leader or one of the members got up and gave a blistering, scathing uh, speech against uh, an issue, or and then implied that one of one of the Republicans was uh, at fault or uh, had they questioned their motivation. Et cetera, et cetera. Then I, I was in charge. I was in seat number one. I had to get up and give the response. Yeah. Uh, and and so I know. And then I remember when I was presiding. A couple of times I had to give the speech about gavel them down because the the chamber would be too loud and noisy and people arguing, and I would have to call them to order. And then I would have to give the speech about, listen, words are powerful instruments, and you cannot impugn another member, and you cannot question their motivation. Uh, I won't tolerate it. Uh, you have to make your argument in a civil way. And, and I had to give that speech a few times, and it, uh, well, it's not fun because you're, it's pretty hot and heavy, and sometimes... Uh, if you're in the minority party, you can get extremely frustrated and you can say things that are unwise. And, uh, and that's when things can erupt. People yeah. get emotional. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what would you say were the differences between the House and Senate? 
Oh, the house was much more raucous and, and uh, um, more fun. And the the uh, the Senate, uh, you know, they call themselves the uh, uh, more <laughs> deliberative body. Yeah. <laughs> and the upper chamber, and that they were always more formal. I mean, the House members always wanted to have fun. And in general, in general, the House members were probably younger, uh, younger folks. Sure. Uh, the senators were more older and more experienced. And uh, uh, as, as I said, they always called themselves more deliberative. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, then, but then at the end of the session or halfway point, you had to work together because, you know, House bills went to the Senate, Senate bills came to the House, and then you had to work them out. You had to work them out together or uh, because if you headed for a conference committee, you never know what was going to happen. Right. Yeah, makes sense. Um, how influential would you say uh, lobbyists were in the Indiana General Assembly? Well, they're very, they're very influential because the Indiana General Assembly, uh, by comparison with other general assemblies around the country, we are very efficient and low cost. Okay. Because uh, other states will provide uh, enough staff that they can do research, they can do, uh, they can um, delve into. Uh, complicated issues in a much more, um, well, in a way that is paid for by the taxpayers of that state. And in Indiana, we don't really have that luxury. We've got the Legislative Services Agency, which is a group of nonpartisan attorneys, and they write the bills and put them in form that would fit into the Indiana Code. But we relied on lobbyists or information. For instance, if you were on the utilities committee, uh, you would rely on um, the lobbyists from Duke and IPL and, and uh, Indiana and Michigan, and, and all of the utilities companies would have their statistics and their information, and and would come at you typically with a pretty united front. Um, well, the tele all the changes in telecommunication um, that I've seen over the years. You know, when I started uh, in the legislature, I had a black dial or push button telephone attached to the wall. And of course, when I left, I had, everyone had a uh, an iPhone, a cell phone that they were attached to the world. Yeah, and so that was a major change in what I saw and. Um, and so, and then one of the other changes was in 1993, I got lots of handwritten, hand addressed letters. And by the time I retired, I didn't get very many of those. I got mostly emails and text messages. Yeah. And there's, and I always assured everyone that um, when I would go to town meetings, I would say, look, if you want to get your opinion heard, or if you want to send a letter, do a hand-addressed envelope with a stamp and a, self and a return address, you handwrite it all. I said, I guarantee you that letter will get attention. But if you're going to send blanket emails, or if you're going to send... Uh, printed postcards that you at the top you scroll representative friend uh, those don't have much effect so save your time and energy okay interesting now did you feel like lobbyists in general were all pretty trustworthy or were there ever cases where you felt like we well, weren't sure if someone was giving you you know an honest uh, viewpoint or you can figure that out. You okay. Know, uh, one of the things I always pray about is discernment. I want to make sure that I am able to judge a person 
and their character yeah. and not be uh, surprised when I get whacked off the knees, you know, at the knees. And, and lobbyists always, I've always described them in town meetings. I say people are uh, <clears throat> of the general opinion that lobbyists uh, are dark old men with black hair slicked back they got a cigar in their mouth and a briefcase with a hundred dollar bill sticking out of it. <laughs> and I said that's not the case at all yeah uh, lobbyists uh, many of them are attorneys many are PhDs many are have master's degrees many are specialists in their field and they're not what that they're not what that Oh, uh, stereotype paints them to be. They're not what I'm. What I said, you know. Yeah. They're 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 not the dark greasy guy with a bag full of money. That's not them at all. Uh, lobbyists are intelligent, educated specialists, and can present their case and their facts very well. And you have to respect that. Or I had to respect that. Right. Sure. So do you think that things like campaign donations or gifts, do you think that had much influence on politicians when you served? Or do you think it, it didn't really impact things much? Of course it had an impact. Okay. And, uh, and early on, <clears throat> when I first started and I, uh, I saw that, holy smokes, you know, like I was getting... Uh, checks were coming unrequested in the mailbox from the beer drinkers of America or the wine and spirits people or um, any other controversial group. Uh, and I asked some of my advisors, I said, well, what do I do about this if I, if I want to really don't want to show up on my campaign finance report that uh, <coughs> all of my donations are coming from the uh, alcohol, tobacco uh, uh, people. And they say, look, you got to be man enough that that donation doesn't buy them anything except maybe you give them uh, enough time to present their case. But you're not going to you're not going to change your position over a, a lunch or a dinner or a ticket to a Pacers game. So you take the money, you take it all, put it in your campaign account, and then you're just honest and upfront with them. And you say, look, you're not buying any influence from me. You're, uh, if you want to contribute to my campaign, I'll accept it. But I am not uh, giving you any special treatment i just won't do that yeah so so yeah um you know that's my attitude towards it sure. at the time uh how influential would you say gerrymandering was when you served well when the democrats do the maps <clears throat> the only way because Indiana is a basically a Republican state, mm -hmm. the only way the Democrats could make inroads was to concentrate their voters. So they would have to concentrate their voters in Indianapolis. They would reach out and get a small amount of Republican territory, but the predominant amount would be Democrat. And the, <laughs> they would do that in Indianapolis, South Bend, Fort Wayne, Terre Haute, uh, of course, up in northwest Indiana. It's... It's uh, it's always been a Democrat stronghold. So, it gerrymandering was the only way they could they could uh, uh, stay in the majority in the House. When Republicans took the majority and drew the maps, uh, for instance, I think I did. I tell you that my first district went from Miami County down to Tipton. I think I told you, shared you with, shared that right. with you. Right, yeah. My first district went Miami County, part of Wabash County, part of Howard County, 
part of Tipton County. And so everything was south. Democrats drew that map. Ten years later, Democrats were still in charge. The district was, my district was turned on its head. All those relationships I had to the south went away because they sent me north through Fulton County, Marshall County, Kosciuszko County, Elkhart County. So I had to establish all new relationships with every county chairman, wow. vice chairman, every board of commissioners, every auditor. Uh, you, you just had every sheriff. You had to go through all that again and establish a relationship and get to know them. But the Democrats did that. They wanted me to quit. They thought they could make me miserable because from where I lived, if I had a meeting in Elkhart, it was 75 miles on not such great road. So, and remember, I'm a farmer. I still have to work for myself. So when I have meetings, lunch meetings in Elkhart, I didn't get anything done. You know, you'd have to drive two hours to a meeting, have your meeting, and then drive two hours home. Well, you can see it pretty well knocks your day in the head. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> So, to that extent, but but you see what they were doing, they were giving me all that Republican territory, all that rural area that would be conservative Republican territory, and then they just wrote me off as, as uh, this district, 23, was going to be Republican no matter what they did. So, they just made it as inconvenient as possible. Um and when we drew the map, the last map that I served, all I asked them, the people doing it, I said, look, just give me something reasonable that's, that I can have continuity and I don't have to drive 150 miles for a lunch meeting and uh, just give me something reasonable. And that's what they did. The last... My last district was Miami County, one township in Fulton County, and uh, about half of Cass County, Logansport. Yeah. Okay. So from based on, you know, your service in the General Assembly then, like, what would you change about the legislative process? What would I change about the legislative process? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Um <laughs> I don't know that there's a lot that I would change I, <clears throat> because I don't want it to be easy to make and change laws. Uh, there needs to be a process. It needs to be difficult. Um, otherwise, they don't mean much. And so I, I, I think it's uh, good to be uh, well, I do know of a couple of things. I would make sure that there were uh, some term limits on committee chairs. Mm, okay. I think. Okay. Um, I think that having term limits on some committee chairs makes sense. Um, I, I was never a fan of term limits. I always said that every two years you've got a chance to limit me. Right. So, um, have at it. And the, uh, but the longevity of some uh, committee chairman probably should be addressed in some fashion. I wouldn't be uh, uh, opposed to that. Yeah, okay. So, from all your experiences, what would you say was the most controversial legislative issue when you served? I, in my second term, they gave me uh, the uh, the repeal of prevailing wage legislation. Interesting. Prevailing wage, and this is only my second term, so I'm not real well known or well versed in this. But I came out of county government, so I knew um, I knew how things worked. And the fact that when there was a public project, you know, a 
a road, a school, a post, or a, a, a county building. Um, there was a like a five county area. The union leaders would get together and they would set the prevailing wage, and the the governmental entity, whatever it was, had to pay it. Yeah, it had to pay it, and. <clears throat> It was generally much more expensive than a private contractor would throw out as a bid. So uh, we, as Republicans, in the majority, were going to do away with it. And I was carrying that legislation, and the uh, all the construction workers, the union guys, showed up at the state house. They, some of them estimated there was three or four thousand of them. They were busting them in from all over. <laughs> they're all out there in their Carhartt jackets and coveralls and got their nose pressed against the glass and they're looking in the book to see what Bill Friend looked like and <laughs> and uh, that you know I was a little fearful at that time because you never knew I mean the we knew that the uh, trash cans in the in the restrooms were full of beer cans and whiskey bottles. So we knew that things could get out of hand. They did not. They did not. But uh, that was very controversial, but we did it. And uh, and then, of course, the toll road, the uh, uh, daylight savings time, those were were difficult issues and uh, not fun, not fun. Yeah, sounds like it. what would you say was the most complex piece of legislation that you worked on? Oh, I, for four years, I worked on trying to get uh, uh, CBD oil legalized, you know, because yeah. it's manufactured from industrial hemp. It has a negligible THC uh, reading. And uh, so I was just always, I always felt that if, if medicinally it could, it could uh, be helpful, what's the problem with it, you know? And uh, it would allow farmers another crop that they could grow to try to make a profit out here on the farm. Yeah. Uh, so that one, that one was controversial. Uh, and then uh, I live in Miami County, and in Miami County is uh, the Russ Beller Deer Farm. So confined deer hunting was a huge issue in the legislature, and the DNR hates it. Uh, but it's a, a it's an opportunity to make a uh, make some money. To make a profit, right? Off of, off of some very uh, difficult land to operate, um, and of course, I was involved with that because he was my constituent. He had the largest farm, and uh, then he got in trouble. Uh, they uh, DNR sued him and said they found. Uh, some drugs in the deer. I don't know. He, anyway, Mr. Beller spent 10 months at the federal penitentiary in Terre Haute uh, because of what I would consider a questionable charges. But then he's my constituent. He's my friend. And, and so anyway, uh, that was very difficult for me. Sure. Yeah, it's um, understandable. Yeah. Um. Let's see, thinking of some different uh, things, I, I sort of read in the newspaper about sort of de- some uh, debates going on when you served. Uh, do you remember a bill about like alternative energy and stuff that you may have been involved with to a certain extent? With ethanol? Uh, yeah, I think it was like some type of like, f- uh, yeah, like f- some type of farming produced well, alternative did, energy. I did uh, Clean Water Indiana was a uh, conservation bill that I did. Yeah. Um, and it broke off a little 
tiny chunk of the cigarette tax and sent it to uh, soil conservation projects around the state. Ah, okay. And, uh, and that was, uh, I was very pleased and proud of that. The soil conservation people were happy with it. I wish it had been a bigger sum of money, but that's all right. Um, it was substantial enough that it helped. I did that one, uh, and then I was always a supporter of ethanol and the ethanol plants and whatever we wanted to do to help market corn. Yeah. And, uh, and that Dale Grubb and I worked together in a bipartisan fashion. We actually had a bill that would we would have required, and this is 20 years ago or so, we would have required that the plastic grocery bags at Kroger's and the stores would be manufactured from corn. And, uh, oh my gosh, you would have thought, you would have thought we were criminals. I mean, we were <laughs> awful people. Why would you yeah. do that? That'll drive up the price of corn. Uh, well, yeah. And, you know, President Reagan said the rising tide will raise all the boats. So, You've got to have a bigger perspective than just yourself. And uh, that, I, I still think that would have been a good idea because uh, the uh, those plastic bags made from corn will, will uh, decompose in the landfill instead of having all that petroleum plastic in there. You could have, uh, you'd have uh, the bags would decompose. Right. Um, what else? And then I was a, a proponent of the ethanol. I got myself in trouble with some of the livestock people over that. They they thought that I was uh, going to jack up the price for, um, I don't know if you know, uh, well, I don't want to use them, but some of the uh, livestock producers thought that I should have been less supportive of ethanol, but uh, mm. I still think it's a, good idea and it's a cheaper oxygenator um the clean the clean air act of many years ago uh required an oxygenator in gasoline and what what is the old one that was made from petroleum was mb met uh, Tertiary butyl. It was a, it's an organic chemical made from uh, petroleum that was used as an oxygenator, especially in uh, metropolitan cities like Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, um, St. Louis. But it's also a known carcinogen, and would get into the well water. And so ethanol was a cheaper, safer alternative to uh, HNTB. Those were controversial things. Uh, gosh. I don't know. I, I, I'm drawing a blank now. No, that's, that's fine. Um, let's see. Another bill I think I read something about that you may have been involved with was the like a school nutrition bill i was involved with a calcium bill uh, okay we had a fellow up here who did uh wanted to get <clears throat> more calcium into children uh simply for their development and uh of their bones and nervous system and it would be a a cheap alternative to um medicating kids and uh so i was involved with that the uh calcium initiative we tried to uh, promote calcium as a, a low cost uh available over-the-counter sort of a thing that was good for kids and it was um so i i think it's it's yeah we passed it yeah it, it was passed yeah, okay. One thing I did, I haven't told you about, but I was, for one year, I was chairman of the uh, oh, 
National Council, NCSL, National Council of State Legislators. And uh, I was chairman of the Ag and International Trade Committee uh, for that group. And it was at the time when Roundup Ready soybeans were coming into play. And Monsanto was starting to charge a fee, <clears throat> a royalty. And they were also uh, taking farmers to court if they would save soybean seed and plant it the following year. They were they were they wanted that to be illegal. And this was the same time I was chairman of the NCSL uh, Ag Committee, and I remember going to. Uh, different meetings, went to San Antonio, and oh my gosh, Monsanto was there, and uh, wrote the science people who had the technology, and it was um, intellectual property is what they, they said. I, I said, well, look, you didn't, in, you didn't invent soybeans, and they would say, well, no, you're right, we did not, but we did improve them with this uh, intellectual property, these genetic changes that we made, and then we have <clears throat> the chemical <clears throat> of uh, Roundup, which can be used to control the weed. So we went round and round and round, but uh, uh, in the end, uh, Monsanto won because, um, you know, quite frankly, they have deeper pockets than I do. Mm, okay. And uh, um, but that was one of the, that was a difficult time for me. Yeah, sure. Um, now, when you served, I believe uh, at some point there was a, a split house session. Do you remember that? I do. Um, it was uh, Manweiler and Greg. <clears throat> and there had been one, a split house before I was elected. Right. Um, and then there was a split house when Paul Manweiler was the speaker. And during that time, he had, <clears throat> he had recommended and we had passed a bill that said whoever, if they're in the, in the occurrence of a 50-50 house, the party that held the Secretary of State's office, the speaker would come from that party. And that was that was Paul's um, Paul Manweiler's bill. It was passed, and don't you know the next election? That's what we had it was a fifty-fifty, and the Democrats had the office. The Democrats had the office, so that meant John Gregg was the speaker, and he presided over a fifty-fifty house. And fifty-fifty is no fun because. Everyone thinks they're in charge. Okay. <laughs> and, and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Yeah, I, I can see how that could cause some issues. Um, I was also the majority leader when the Democrats all went to uh, Illinois. To oh, Urbana. yeah. Yeah, so for however many weeks that was, what was it, 11 weeks or some such thing, um, Yeah, I would have, to, I would have to get up every day or two and give some kind of an emotional speech about you know, uh, you need to come back. Uh, your people are not represented. <coughs> you're not serving your constituents. You're not serving the state of Indiana, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And and you, and you give that to your own members because there's no Democrats there. Half the chamber's empty. So that was that was a difficult time as well. Yeah, I can imagine so. Um, so why did you end up leaving the Indiana General Assembly? Made a promise to myself that I was not going to be uh, going to that building when I was seventy years old. And yeah. So uh, I left when I was 69 and uh, I also had a very suitable replacement that I could 
was I felt confident handing it off to, and it was not going to be just a jump ball that uh, you know <clears throat> several people would uh, file for the job. It, it, the job went to uh, Ethan Manning, and uh, he's uh, he grew up just down the road from me. He's very interested, active, and intelligent when it comes to political things. He's making a name for himself in the in the General Assembly right now. And so I felt confident and I thought if I don't step away now and fulfill my promise to myself that I'm not going to be there when I'm 70, um, there's a good chance Ethan would be in Washington working for a congressman or a senator. So Ethan was elected when he was uh, 25 or 6 and uh, he's just now 30, 31 and doing very well, vice chairman of uh, utilities committee, and I hear nothing but good good remarks. Yeah, so that's why I left. I left. And after twenty six years, things aren't as much fun as they used to be, and I was having foot trouble uh, with all the walking, standing, and the marble floors. It was just time. It's time to go, and. Now I've got a two-and-a-half-year-old grandson that's here. His parents and he have moved up here from Brazil. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So that's the one that you just heard a little while ago. Yeah. He's uh, two-and-a-half, and I told everyone that Nicholas was moving up here, and he was bringing his parents with him. Yeah. uh, (laughs) Cool. Yeah, it is cool. Um, so how would you summarize your time then overall as a state legislator? Well, I like to think that I was part of a team that was effective. Um, I like to use the word effective. You can serve, you can fill a seat, you can warm the chair, but I always wanted to know how effective I was and And you can be effective in many ways because you can pass legislation, you can file a bunch of bills, or you can work with other (coughs) legislators on common goals. And, and, And it's how you're perceived and how you get along with people, uh, that you're working with. And I, I, so I like to think that I was an effective legislator and that I was an effective leader because I served uh, on the leadership team for uh, uh, 16 years. And so I I feel like, and during that time, I feel like we brought Indiana a long way. And I, so I, I guess I would summarize and say that I, I feel good about my service. I feel good about my, time there and I still have lots of friends and in fact I <clears throat> there was a group called the Association of Retired Indiana Members of the General Assembly or MEGA for short and uh, it was started a few years ago by a, uh, Representative Brian Hassler after he went out of the General Assembly Brian Hassler started this group and it's the only one in the nation that we know of but uh, Brian got sick with cancer and passed away Uh, Ralph fully picked it up and then Ralph and his wife had some health issues so I my wife and I Ann and I picked it up and have made a good list we and we've had we just in September had a uh, uh, get together uh, had 60 some people there uh, at the Grissom Air Museum, uh, retired legislators and spouses. Wow. And, and it was a fun, fun event. Uh, we did the Air Museum. We did, we went to the Milestone Event Center, which is just across the field. And then I, <clears throat> I lived next to uh, the Vaughn Lake Kennels, which is the largest dog training facility for. Um, bomb dogs, drug dogs, cadaver dogs in the world. 
and uh, Vaughn Lake Kennels, if you've never heard of them. And uh, they brought a dog and did a demonstration of, of a dog who could find drugs and was also, um, they had a guy in a bite suit and they let the dog have him a few times. So um, anyway, we had a great day. And so I, um, I feel good that people still think enough of me and respect me that they would respond to invitations to come to an event like that. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Um, let's see, thinking in a big picture, what lessons do you think you learned from your experiences in the General Assembly? Things are never as they appear. Okay. Okay. That, I learned that all early on in government that <laughs> you're... Uh, how you are perceived or how a, a couple or a business or a farmer is perceived uh, when you get closer, things are seldom exactly as you thought. Um, for good, bad, or indifferent, that's just my observation. And uh, um, I learned how to get along with people. And I learned that sometimes with people... All you can say is um, we have to agree to disagree right. and, and leave it at that. I had a lot of that about confined feeding. Um, you know, I'm a hog farmer, a contractor, and we have two buildings. Um, and people can be critical of me for, but it's just a matter of misunderstanding as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, did you have any regrets as a legislator? Any regrets? Well, <clears throat> after 26 winters being away from my wife, yeah, while she was working as a nurse, um, and being away from the family, um, our youngest son, Daniel, was, I think... He was born in. He was born in uh, eighty six. I was elected in ninety two. So he was six years old. He basically grew up with me being with his dad being the state representative. And I, I'm not sure <laughs> how good that was. <laughs> but okay. Anyway, yeah, it, uh, it is what it is. I and I, but I regretted being away from my wife and family. Uh, so much and uh, but I I don't regret my service I always told groups that uh, this is your government you need to participate a democracy fails when when good people sit back and ignore it and and I said you got to participate and uh, whether you're uh, at the <clears throat> very local level a school board member whatever you just need to participate and uh so I did my part. I think I'm, I think I'm, uh, I did a decent job, a good job and helped make Indiana a better place. But, uh, you know, I'm done. I, I uh, when Jackie Walorski was killed, uh, there were several people who made passes at me that maybe I would be willing to replace to fill that seat in Congress in Washington. And I said, there's no way. I'm 73. You don't go to Washington when you're 73 and be a backbencher. And uh, I wouldn't have done that. And I said, my priority is my two-and-a-half-year-old grandson. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So I think they've got a good guy with Rudy Yakum who has replaced him. Uh, or is filling the seat that Jackie mm -hmm. Jackie left. So, Do you she have was a good? Uh, she, she was a very wonderful person. I really, Jackie and I were good friends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Do you have a proudest moment from your experiences as a legislator?
Oh, one that's interesting is after the Colts won the Super Bowl, I had Peyton Manning. We had to hide him in my office to keep, so he was not being mobbed. And <laughs> so I had I had Peyton in there, shook hands with him, and uh, wow. You know, he's six five, and his hands are like catcher's mitts. I mean, yeah. his hands, I've got big hands, but when it's nothing compared to his. Yeah. And, uh, that's, uh, that's wild, okay. And then we had, oh, some race car people, and I've had senators, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I had lots of happy moments and proud moments. I also had... As as all legislators, you have frustrating times when you think, "Man, why am I doing this?" And uh, but yeah, I had several times that I felt proud, and uh, I was always pleased when I got invited to the governor's office to talk about things, and that they would listen to me and uh, 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 respect my opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, so what advice would you give to future legislators or even current legislators? Learn how to be effective. You'll learn what works and what doesn't. <clears throat> Respect the fact that uh, you are one of a hundred in the House and you're one of 150 in the legislative body. And um, those other opinions about issues, those things are as important to them as yours is to you. And uh, you can think you're right. You can feel you're right. You can think, how could anyone think I'm wrong? Well, believe me, it'll show up. <laughs> yeah. People will discover why you're, they think you're wrong. But... Um, I, uh, I just think, how can you be effective? What do you do? Uh, what do you do? I mean, you can, you have to be careful of flattery in this political business because if people want you to do something, you can be the greatest guy in the world. Um, so they can talk you into things that you normally would have sense enough to avoid. Mm. So okay. avo avoid and be wary of the, of the flattery. Yeah. Um, what, in your opinion, do you think is the most important work of the Indiana General Assembly? Well, I think it would be... Um, I think it would be maintaining order in a system that is <clears throat> beneficial to all of Indiana and maintaining order and continuity uh, and providing an education for our children, both at K-12 and uh, university level. I just think there are many things like that that we can do. And that are very important. Yeah. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Um, let's see. What would you say the public doesn't know about the Indiana General Assembly? I don't think they know exactly what we do, how we do it, why we have to uh, abide by certain rules and statutes uh, that were set up long and long ago by our forefathers and they've worked for a lot of a long time and <clears throat> and they also don't appreciate that legislators are people who have a personal life as well and uh, if they see you in a headline or if they see you on tv or on the computer and it's all about a certain issue that's just one part of their life. They probably have a spouse at home. They probably have kids at home. They have a job, a business. They have a farm. They have things. You know, you could, there are very few of us who 
have the ability to dedicate 100% of ourselves to be in the state representative or senator. You have to make your time, share your expertise, and share yourself. And you, and most of all, you take the risk. I told people this who say, well, I'd like to run for I say, okay, are you ready for the risk? Well, what do you mean risk? I said, you've got to put yourself out there and not everybody's going to like you. Yep. Not everyone's going to agree with you and not everyone's going to vote for you. So you need to understand that going in or you'll get your feelings hurt. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's it's definitely, I guess you have to kind of develop pretty thick skin when you run for office. Absolutely. I've got to hide like a turtle. You can't, I'm, I'm yeah. you can't, uh, it, it, I don't get my feelings hurt very easily anymore. Yeah. And that's just something you develop because when, when you're new, you are sensitive. As you get older, you learn to uh, let it roll off your back. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. But just don't forget that that other person they might have situations that you never knew about and they find themselves in that extraordinary situation just like you are and you need to respect their feelings. Yeah. Let's see, last few questions then. Um, how do you think the state of Indiana has changed over time? Well, we've gone from... Uh, such a strong agricultural state to one more of manufacturing and service and education. Um, when I left, there were, well, the last few years in the General Assembly, there were only two farmers. It was Don Leahy and myself. Don's from Brookston, chairman of the Ag Committee, and he's retired now. Uh, over on the Senate side, Gene Lysing from Southern Indiana, uh, she was a nurse, but her husband had been a farmer and was killed in an accident. Um, but when the General Assembly began, almost everyone was a farmer. Yeah. And that's why they were met in the wintertime when uh, they didn't have crops to do. So, uh, so <clears throat> the change that way uh, from agriculture to manufacturing and, and service, those sorts of things. Those are obvious. Um, technology has changed Indiana tremendously, just like it's changed everywhere else. You know, I told you, I started in the General Assembly, I had a black telephone attached to the wall. And by the time I left, all of my younger representatives, you know, they were on their cell phone, they were texting, they were tweeting, they were doing all the technological stuff, and yeah. much of it was escaping me. I was not, I'm not a, interested in all that stuff. So those are the major changes. Uh, I, I think that uh, we are uh, still a great state and very uh, uh, good condition financially and that's just from good practices hard decisions and uh, sticking to budgets and things of that nature and not borrowing tons of money to do frivolous things yeah do you think the people of indiana have changed at all or sure the demographics have changed because of the changes we talked about earlier yeah <clears throat> many fewer farmers and that's just a matter of the economics and the changing times um, and the fact that farmers uh, individuals work much larger uh, much larger acreages in order to survive because of uh, the cost that they have to incur to uh, purchase equipment purchase land put out a crop it's uh, it's very capital intensive, and some people are not willing to do that or can't do it or 
the bank won't let them. So, um, and then uh, our younger generation has gone off to school and and the military, and they've learned trades and they've learned occupations, and um, so they've changed. You know, those attitudes have changed, but. Uh, still and all, when people are married and have a family, um, they still have all the basics that they have to do. And that is feed the family, clothe the family, have a house and a car and, you know, those things. So that's kind of when reality sets in. Uh, our kids coming up that have moved up here from Brazil uh, uh, are talking about all the adult things they are doing now. Uh with a two and a half year old, uh, now they're doing adult stuff. So. Mm, okay. Um, what hasn't changed about the people of Indiana? I think that the people of Indiana still are um, good, hardworking. They have a good work ethic. I think they have uh, good values for the most part. And I think that they are um, industrious and and want to take advantage of self improvement and uh, being a part of uh, communities and churches and schools that uh, allow them to uh, participate in a social manner and uh, have the, uh, their families uh, grow and develop that sort of thing. I, I think that people of, Bay, of Indiana are, are very industrious and, and uh, they're fruitful in the things that uh, that they do. Um, <clears throat> and we have, you know, Kokomo calls itself the city of firsts. And, uh, and then if you are, uh, if you're ever up in, Mentone, Indiana, there's uh, the Bell Helicopter Museum. Mr. Bell was from Mentone, Indiana. Mm, okay. Uh, so we have people from all over the state who have done remarkable things, and and I, I still think that that's um, possible for the people and citizens of this state to do remarkable things. Yeah, absolutely. And last question, what do you want the people of Indiana to know about their influence on the Indiana General Assembly? I would say that uh, the, I always used to say that uh, my motto on my handout cards was, I was a friend who listens. And the public needs to understand that in the General Assembly, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. The public needs to be vocal, the public needs to speak up, and the public needs to be able to make their points and make their feelings known about issues and about their wants and their needs. And of course, uh, needs will be addressed first, wants will come somewhere down the line. But it's just important, as I said earlier, to participate in your government. Um, it's your government, and uh, you get what you deserve. And if you don't participate and if you don't pay attention, um, you might not like the result. Yeah. So, so participate. Right. Don't be afraid. Get in there. Jump in there. And... Uh, even if it's at a what you think is a lower level, you have to do it. You have to do it. Yeah, true. All right. Well, is there anything that I didn't ask about that you wanted to mention, or no? I and I hope I've been helpful to you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, lots of good information. So I appreciate it. But uh, no, at this time, I think I'm done. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well. Uh, Thank you so much for taking part of the project then.